Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My name is Imadul Karim. I am head of Department of Business Administration at Greenwich University. I welcome you all on behalf of Greenwich University to this webinar session. The topic of the webinar is sustainability of businesses during COVID-19. To talk on this topic, we have panel of speakers from Pakistan. We have Mr. Rafiq Rangoonwala. He is the CEO for the quick food industry, Monsalva. Then we have from UK, Mr. Akka Nemo Odon. He is the Africa Strategy Advisor at Lancaster University, UK, and CEO Envirofly Consulting, UK Limited. Then we have from Malaysia, Mr. Shahzeb Khan. He is the Plant Controller at Racket Bankiza, Malaysia. Last but not the least, we have from Malaysia, Ms. Lucera Farro. She is the ex accounting and reporting manager at L'Oreal Pakistan Private Limited. The moderator for today's webinar is Mr. Ali Raza Jilani, who is the head of diplomatic affairs at Greenwich University. I hope this is going to be an informative session for us and the audience as well. To proceed further, over to you, Mr. Ali Raza Jilani. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Imad Saab. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, the webinar, Greenwich University's webinar on sustainability of businesses in 2019. Uh, before I formally start the conversations, uh, let me just ask you how's life uh, as far as the pandemic is concerned. I'll start with uh, Rafiq Saab. Well, life is great as much as, as the best as it could be. A lot of uncertainties, but uh, you know, that's what. Uh, um, makes things exciting and keeps you going. So I, uh -huh. I have taken this as a challenge and right. as well as an opportunity. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Odon. Well, so I think for me, it's been a bit tricky. So my job involves me traveling. I travel an awful lot across uh, over 30 African countries. So you can imagine uh, a lockdown situation. I've been in the UK now and locked down for over three months. But I think what it does is it opens opportunities for more exploration of new initiatives and new ways of doing business, which I hope mm -hmm. to share today. So it's, 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 been, it's been hectic, but it's been fun. Right. Thank you. Uh, Shazib Kansal. Yeah. So here in Malaysia, things are under control. So we are uh, getting back to the normal life. But it's still, I think it's uh, it will take time to get a normal life back again. Let's see, mm -hmm. it's still surviving. Yeah, sure. Mr. Sarah. Um, um, since I'm in Malaysia, the country uh, is, is bringing back to normal, uh, the mm -hmm. new normal, of course. And uh, um, I'm glad that uh, you know we, uh, as as uh, people living over here, we are able to adapt to uh, the changes that are being put in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so far, so good. Um, I hope the kind of uh, uh, you know the kind of changes and and the kind of SOPs that have been introduced here, they can be introduced elsewhere as well. And the right. uh, pandemic goes off in Pakistan as well as in the UK. The UK has obviously, it has reopened. Uh, and I hope it uh, happens so in Pakistan as well, soon enough. Sure. Imadul Karim, sir. Yes, uh, we are enjoying the lockdown. But uh, with reference to the work, uh, it's very hectic. Uh, mm -hmm. We are engaged 24-7 in different tasks uh, given by the organization, so still surviving. Okay, thank fair you. enough. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, you very much. You Sorry? You're not, you're not going to get away with it. What about you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sir, uh, I mean, adaptation is the key. Uh, I see the pandemic as a portal. Uh, I mean, Arundhati Roy uh, very famously said this in an article that it's it's an opportunity to actually uh, change the life as we know it. Uh, so looking forward to uh, you know uh, some some sort of uh, room for innovation where you have it, and uh, maybe you know uh, a little trying to go back to to uh, uh, what we've left behind as well. Uh, thank you uh, for the initial comments. Uh, so here's how it's going to be. I'll just quickly uh, present a small uh, preamble of how we build up the discussions to this particular topic. And then I seek your comments uh, individually against this. Uh, Greenwich University basically conceptualized this uh, particular webinar, reckoning the situation 
so here's the preamble uh, that I have to present. COVID-19 has affected the entirety of life, as we know, with ripple effects across social, cultural, economic, and political functioning. The pandemic has not only exposed our pre-existing social and systemic vulnerabilities, but is also bound to shape the future of life at large. UNDC, uh, UNDP classified it as the greatest challenge confronting humanity since World War II, given its catastrophic implications globally. The pandemic has sent shockwaves across economies affecting agriculture, industry, as well as services sectors, bankrupting businesses around the world, causing millions of job losses across regions. COVID-19 has blurred the distinction between global multinational corporations and localized small and medium-sized enterprises with its devastating effects. Tourism, travel, and hospitality sectors have experienced its domino effect and continue to be in an uphill battle for survival. The likes of Emirates and Etihad have virtually gone bankrupt and it would take the business world decades to surmount the effects even by the most ambitious measures. And yet, COVID-19 is around and far from over. The situation urges the need for revisiting the efficacy of business leadership and crisis management that the pandemic has surely tested. Several questions have risen while neither there's a definitive end line for COVID-19 nor a scientific conviction on the possibility that there are no other viruses like this. So I'd like to, first of all, uh, seek uh, Mr. Uh, Rafiq Rangoonwala's comment on how the situation has affected businesses at large. You see, I have uh, been through a lot of crises. Uh, like we have gone through 1971, the separation of Bangladesh. It was a crisis for us in Pakistan. Then I have seen the, the stock market crash uh, of 1980s in the United States, uh, the Gulf War, and uh, you know then. Pakistan, you know, the, the fun never stops. So there is one challenge or the other. Uh, but this one is very different. Uh, yeah. This one is something we have never thought that uh, we'll face. Uh, and the problem with this is that this is an unknown enemy. Uh, we are still finding out uh, about this COVID-19. Uh, as you can see that every day, every week, there's some new information. But obviously, we are today much more educated than what we were three months back. Uh, yeah. We uh, don't know what works and what don't work in exact way because I remember in the beginning we were told that you know don't need to wear masks because the vapors are so heavy and it will just drop and now mask is a must. Uh, huh. Then there are a lot of possibility theories. So huh. the fighting with an unknown enemy uh, huh. is something this is very difficult and uh, uphill task. Uh, huh. I think that the major challenge is the anxiety. It's not knowing what's coming and what's going to be next. Uh, huh. If we had known, uh, like in any other situation, that it's going to be over in a week, two weeks, a month, then you can prepare yourself mentally and uh, financially. But this is huh. something that I don't think anyone can uh, for sure say that, you know, uh, it's going to be over next six months or, or even a year. I think life is going to be very difficult and different from what it used to be because uh, we had enjoyed, uh, you know, opening uh, the mixing up and we had enjoyed going out without any uh, precautions and stuff like that. It's not going to be like that for quite some time. But I, you know, with all those challenges that I mentioned and the crisis that I have gone through, I have seen that people have found opportunities in that. Uh, business in Pakistan, I can talk about. I, I, I can't. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on uh, the international business. At, you know, sitting here, uh, I think uh, some businesses are doing well uh, uh -huh. because they have uh, tried to adapt to the situation. Uh, and by virtue of what segment they are in, for example, the food business, especially the, the essential food. I'm not talking about restaurants. Uh, they are uh, doing much better than probably the electronic business or uh, you know the other kind of business like textile business or something like that. Huh. So depending on which business you are in and uh, what you are dealing with, uh, there are challenges. The biggest fear that I have in this situation is that uh, we might see a lot of bankruptcies in SMEs, which we will I'm sure talk about later. Huh. 
So it's going to be a heck of a challenge. Thank you very much, Rafiq, sir. Uh, can I now move on to Dr. Odon for your initial comment, please? Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for inviting me. An absolute pleasure to be here. I think for me, um, I think what, what kind of jump started my feeling about what has, what has been provided for us is I woke up in the morning and I was watching, watching CNN. And I think uh, on CNN there was a news item about an American couple that got married. And interestingly, it was a virtual wedding. And I mm -hmm. remember that the person playing the piano was in a different location. The priest yeah. who was wedding them was in a different location. Um, um, the person who was uh, if you like uh, playing the instruments, singing the song in a different location. I mean, mm -hmm. it's even possible the, the couple were also in a different location, but for them, they were not in a different location. So that I'm thinking, that's quite, that's quite interesting. And at, at the end of the event, uh, they asked the groom, and it was like, um, um, for him, it was the cheapest, low cost, most engaging wedding they could have thought about. Now, I was wondering mm -hmm. why is that the case? And the reason was because many people who couldn't attend the event, if you like, normally, if it was a physical event, were able to attend. And so I started asking myself, does it mean that the fundamental resources that made that happen suddenly became available because of COVID? No, it didn't. There was internet before COVID. There was a potential for Zoom uh, streaming of events before COVID. But my point is, right. what COVID has done for me is provided businesses an opportunity to think a bit more creatively about their business. Not long yeah. afterwards, I saw um, some museums in Italy show a museum, yeah. like a showing of a museum, and people sign on virtually. Companies and, and uh, if like uh, cinemas had working arrangements virtually. So my point yeah. is, for me, COVID is almost like a, a global problem. But the point is, every business, every enterprise is based fundamentally by default in the provision of solutions to a problem whether by way of products or services so if yeah. covid is a global problem i see that the every business owner should also see it in as a, as a, as a matter of as, as a potential uh, 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 raw material for innovation and creativity in order to begin to align themselves towards new models of service provision or put the development right. to actually provide those problems. That's the why I see the whole event. So for me, it's been a, a, a different, a, a entirely different arrangement entirely. I've had to change my business model totally. And I, I, find it, I find it quite exciting that if owners of businesses can actually see it as an opportunity, even though in the midst of the pressures and the challenges, then there could be a beginning point of sustainability. Okay, so the pandemic holds a lot of promise as far as you're concerned. I'll come back to you on that. Uh, moving on to Shazib Khan now, uh, for your initial comments, sir. Yeah, yeah. so basically as uh, everybody is saying, it's this this uh, pandemic, it's, I think it's posing a significant challenges for all the businesses. Uh, and I think all the business leadership is working on it to overcome this or fighting hard to uh, basically survive in these tough times of COVID-19. So just a few points I would like to add here or highlight. Uh, one is the quick response. I think the, the quick response is the key here. Um, how the businesses uh, are responding to the, to the developing situation. Uh, if they need to take the decision now, like if they wait for it, like it will go over, it will, if they wait for some time, I think they will lose their opportunities. Like for example, the businesses which are uh, producing uh, the products which are directly being used to fight uh, combat against this virus like the disinfectant face masks the hand sanitizers or the, or the pharma industry so i think it's it's uh, now is the time to invest or to build their capabilities because uh, they need to analyze the demand and this demand will not go over soon like this uh, like the need of disinfectants or the hygiene the importance of hygiene uh, uh, i think has uh, uh, has uh, the long term uh, impact on us now on all the societies everywhere ev uh, all over the world and i think right. the disinfectant of all the hygiene products will uh, will be there in the in the basket uh, of the groceries uh, for the years to come so it ha it will have a long term impact on on the on the demand on the business uh, businesses as well as on the con consumers uh, behavior also so right. this is on uh, on the businesses which are directly uh, being involved in the fighting the viruses 
but for the other business like the food sector or uh, maybe the accounting firms or other businesses which are not directly like the electronics uh, rangunal sahab was saying or the automobile industry these uh, these businesses are in tough times definitely uh, but i think they can what they can do is they can support the community and they can basically help alleviate the uh, the underprivileged group of our society so in this way they can at least uh, make their presence known uh, in these difficult times and as well as help the uh, the society uh-huh. and it will definitely uh, build their reputation as well uh, so definitely a difficult time so it's uh, easier said than done uh, so this is one thing like the quick response and uh, the second is like uh, the business should promote the culture of safety and security also like uh, they should provide the culture to basically uh, help their employees uh, remain safe uh, at the work uh-huh. premises so they they need to show the confidence to their their employees also uh, because obviously there is a lot of inse- job insecurity also there in the market so they, they need uh-huh. to show some confidence to their employees they need to basically provide like pp is like personal protective equipments like these uh, the face masks and so other these things so that the employees can come to the workplace and feel safe so i think this is important to have a long term relationship with employees and uh, and not only the employees i think businesses should is, uh, discourage things like uh, for example many businesses are discouraging the cash transactions and they are going cashless so this uh, this is not only for the employee safety for the general public safety also so the, these are the things like the companies are also promoting the work from home culture so i think all the employees should be equipped with all the resources uh, so that they can work from home they can basically just by uh, keeping them safe so these these uh, these are the few things which i think the business are uh, basically uh, doing it or they should adapt it quickly hmm Thank you very much for articulating uh, the bare minimum uh, survival requirements for businesses. Uh, you also uh, tapped a critical element of sustainability. Uh, as far as the dimension of sustainability is concerned, it has three aspects. So uh, when you say the economics, it also involves social and then environmental. You touched on the social element, which I'll again come back to you, especially talking about the corporate social responsibility aspect of businesses where you said they could definitely you know mobilize finances and uh, resources to to help the communities as well uh, moving on to uh, ms sarah for your initial comments thank you ali uh, all of us know that uh, the covid-19 pandemic has um, touched upon every life uh, across uh, all the continents and um, uh, businesses uh, are now faced with the uh, challenges they never thought um, even existed um, in the economic world uh, you know everything that the business businesses were doing was was brought into question you know uh, the, the way they operated um, uh, the efficiencies they thought they thought they had and uh, the way they their employees worked and uh, the the consumer behaviors they thought that existed uh the products they thought were their star products or the mo- most competitive products uh you know and um, also how quickly the companies could adapt to the the challenge and the changes that uh, were standing right in front of them um i think this was a very tough time for businesses because businesses who couldn't keep up um uh, with, with with the pace of change they simply fizzled out uh, we saw plenty of businesses closing down or uh, you know um they just downsized their operations so i think right. uh, f- for me this just this was a point to ponder you know in, in case of such such a situation uh, how quickly the business, businesses are supposed to adapt uh, themselves to to the situation hmm. all right thank you very much i mean there, there's a very small uh, and and uh, uh, short window for transitioning uh to this new normal uh which again I'll I'll come back to you and we'll talk about uh, responsible production and consumption as well uh coming back to uh, Rafiq sahab you spoke about uh the human resource uh can you shed some more light on uh the health and mental well-being of your human resource especially in in uh this time when you see a lot of uh, layoffs going around uh bankruptcies around uh across organizations uh how how do you see um, you know the the issues of job security 
uh, and safety affecting uh, the mental well-being of uh, em employees uh, around the world, and uh, not just in Pakistan generally. You see, financial security is uh, an absolute must uh, for an emotional health, because if you are not able to pay your bills, then you not be emotionally uh, settled or uh, in a comfortable right. position, uh, especially when you have family and in a country where uh, one person earns and six depends on him or her uh, to right. feed them. So that's uh, that becomes quite challenging, not just for him or her, but for the entire family because everybody right. comes to stress. The other aspect is, again, as I said, not knowing what will happen. Even people right. who have jobs, are not very sure if they will be on the job next week or next month uh, mm -hmm. to face a pay cut. You know, in some sure. instances that has happened as well. Uh, sure. In US, there's called something called furlough, sent on furloughs. Okay, that is also not very comfortable. Although the US government has been sending them checks in terms of uh, economic uh, help. But in our countries, which is, we are a poor country, we can't afford these kind of things. I and mean, the number of uh, people we have as, as population, then a lot of people have they have lost uh, loved ones or people that uh, they, they knew, uh, whether the friends or relatives or, or relatives of the friends. Because I remember a few months back, it, like two or three months back, it was just a number for us. Okay, hmm. we used to hear or see that there's so many COVID positive uh, patients in Karachi or in Pakistan or in US or in UK or somewhere. Now we hear, we, we hear about people that we know that they have passed away, okay? Uh, and the people we know that they are in quarantine because of infection. So uh -huh. this is also going to take its toll. And, uh, you know, I am I'm, I'm cons concerned and, and, uh, and I, I just hope that I'm wrong, that uh, we'll lose some more dear ones. And, and we don't know whether we'll, we are going to be one of them as well. You know, the problem with this unknown enemy is that we can only take precaution. But the uh, thing is that the way it's explained, that it's like you're going to get it regardless whether you like it or not. Okay. So that is quite uh, challenging. But I think what we have to do is to, uh, as a business leaders, uh, we'll have to keep our, uh, you know, uh, employees uh, motivated. We have to keep continuously assuring them uh, that hopefully that, uh, the, these kind of challenges they will not have to face. And... Uh, I don't know if, if uh, we have uh, some counseling available because if somebody has lost a, a loved one, then they, they need counseling. And unfortunately in Pakistan, we don't have concept of these things. We only go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist when oh. and it's a stigma. People think that he has lost his mind, okay? Or he has, he's been under some kind of spell. That's why he's going to a pizza or he's going to a, a shrink. Uh, oh social challenges that we we'll have to face so maybe some uh, HODs or, or, or departmental heads or whatever will have to take uh, part into this they will have to become part counselor as well and uh, people uh, but I think that the real emotional challenge is going to come it hasn't come yet once it's uh, over with a little bit and then we'll see that uh, what scar is going to leave but we'll have to prepare for it now otherwise uh, it will be very difficult to handle the situation. Thank you very much. Uh, you're also touching another critical element, which is a predictable business environment, not just for the employees and the individuals, but also for the enterprises and the organizations, uh, which is uh, not quite so at the moment. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'll now move to Dr. Odon. Uh, you spoke uh, about this tremendous room for innovation that the pandemic has uh, kind of created. Uh, how do you see uh, this this particular uh, pandemic as a, ca a catalyst for uh, you know different kind of innovations to be introduced, especially as far as the SMEs are concerned? And maybe you could also shed some light on the African perspective. Thank you very much for the question, Ali. So I think um, in in some sense. Right? Fundamental, like I established earlier on, um, um, crisis and challenges and disruptions kind of gives a background for innovation and creativity. And right. I think we've seen that in the last in the last five to six months. The the level of um, of virtual innovation or or bis new business models has developed in the last six months 
has been incredible, literally. And look, things like uh, the capacity for you to kind of uh, think about e-commerce as an additional dimension to every business. Is there a potential for it? Maybe there is, but remote working is becoming like a norm. Does that provide a new environment for new businesses, for new ways of communication or doing business? Online education, ed tech, it's become like the order of the day. I mean, and so the universities will never consider, or institutions will never consider virtual learning as an important dimension to this new, this new space. Have they considered that? New ways of logistics, new ways of, of communication. The healthcare will be a big deal. The health support systems done virtually, done by online through different models has become so. Every market you touch, every sector you touch, and I check this, you only need to add tech at the end of the sector, and there is a provision. So if it's agri, agri tech, if it's education, edu tech, if it's inter, if, whatever it is. So there, there's, there's almost like a, a layers and layers of opportunities that you can begin to innovate on to address the same market, a revised market, or a new market in the provision of your product or your service. Which is why the average business owner needs to sit back and think a bit more creatively across the supply chain. So what can I innovate on? So this is of Africa. Africa is over a billion people, 55 countries. So you used to do your business in Kenya and your focus was a physical business. They came to your shop. That was fantastic. But in the era you now live, you've been on lockdown for over three months. Is there somebody in nearby Tanzania that can yeah. actually subscribe to your offer? Is there somebody in Nigeria? It's a massive continent. So my point is, mm. automatically, you understanding the leverage of providing your product, your service in a virtual environment increases your market. Because when you restrict your space, you restrict your place. So automatically. Mm. Now, mm. That, that, for, for this to happen, that means you have to bring into a new dimension around partnerships. So if you never consider other jurisdictions as a potential opportunity for you to do your business in, right now, the world is an open space, especially if you are able to do enough research to find out which environments, jurisdictions, which market niches, which segments can I also provide a service to that I never considered. What COVID has done is given an opportunity for you to sit back, do a bit more uh, introspection and, and research and, and find out how can I navigate my business? Because guess what? If you don't begin to think about navigating your business or being innovative at the moment, people will leave you behind. It's as simple as that. So I think, I think my point is what COVID has done is get businesses to think a bit more differently about the opportunity for innovation for that space. I mean, most people have got mobile phones. What do they do with mobile phones? I, I mean, I, I, for, for, I'll give an example. So my, my business is around providing physical training. So I had to travel to a location to deliver training to universities, to vice chancellors, to professionals. But I've been on lockdown for four months. Now, do you know I wrote out a program just literally two months ago, and the number of students I've been able to reach in two months is more than the whole number of students I reached the whole of last year in two months. But the point is, it requires some research a bit more tweaking, some sort yeah. of developing of some skills we'll talk about later to be able to adapt yourself to this new environment. So every yeah. business, every sector, just add tech to it and figure out is there a market that you can provide some part or full part or some dimension or element of your current business to virtually. And sometimes it's a function of even promoting and profiling yourself to be able to increase your market space. Right. Thank you very much. It's very interesting to hear from you on that because uh, there's a lot of uh, talk going around globalization being a liability, uh, yeah. especially with the vulnerabilities that the pandemic has exposed. So it's very good to hear from you on uh, in terms of you know some, some some of the ways to actually strategize how we could still use the agency of globalization for our trade and then you know other uh, purposes as well. Thank you. Uh, I'll now move on to uh, Shahzeb Khan. Uh, you spoke about uh, the social element, the social responsibility element. I'll, I'd, I'd want you to actually shed some light on that in terms of you know what exactly could businesses contribute? Because as far as smaller countries are concerned, 
uh, there's also a talk that uh, you know enforcing lockdowns could be more expensive than addressing the pandemic itself. Uh, now, in smaller countries, because of lack of financial resources, we will have to mobilize domestic resources, uh, also including from the private sector. And that is where uh, the social responsibility will be located. And it's going to be a critical component moving forward uh, to help communities uh, thrive in a way. Uh, so that's one aspect that I'd uh, you know, uh, want to hear from you. The, the other side is uh, you also happen to be a chartered accountant. So what about the financial contingency of these different organizations and the business models that we have in place right now? And uh, how do you see these uh, shifting uh, gears moving forward? Okay, so regarding your first point on the corporate social responsibility, so yes, as I mentioned in my uh, initial comments also, that I think it's a time for the private sector to come forward to help the community. And uh, yes, uh, the the countries like Pakistan, like India, Bangladesh, they, they can't afford to have uh, longer lockdowns. Uh, uh, they don't have, uh, the government does not have the resources to support the masses. So uh, it's uh, I think I think it's other countries also all the countries are slowly and gradually opening uh, all the businesses everything. So for the especially for Pakistan, it um, I think it is uh, it is uh, the responsibility of uh, like the NGOs like uh, even the private sector organizations or companies also to yeah. come forward and to basically. Um, uh, make a fund out of it like uh, you know many MNCs they are now creating a fund uh, mm -hmm. for this COVID-19 support it's not only for uh, like their, uh, your own country like it's like for MNCs they are building a fund and mm -hmm. through that one they can support uh, the other countries uh, uh, the, the underprivileged sector also so I think right. this is one thing where, like uh, the companies can pull up maybe uh, the not, not only the MNCs like the other companies other big groups they they can combine and they can make a, a pool or a fund and through that fund uh, I think the support can be given to uh, uh, to the community which uh, which is basically uh, struggling in these tough times so right. that uh, that is one thing and on the second uh, expect like the financial contingency plan so yes, I think uh, I think the business leadership across all the industries, across all markets, they are uh, working uh, to have their strategic plans in place uh, to fight this, uh, to survive rather in these uh, tough times. So because uh, it's, I think it's not uh, only any one market. I think this is uh, like the businesses which 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 are growing also due to this uh, pandemic. They're also working on the contingency plan. It's not, it's not like we uh, we launched all the line or uh, basically establish a factory for, for, for example, the face mask. So what will happen now if uh, the demand will go down? Uh, and so it, it, they need to be uh, very much careful in investing their resources, investing their time. So yes, I think all the companies are working to have a right strategy. Uh, balance strategy they, they they should not basically uh, take uh, much risk in investing a lot of resources and then everything goes away so uh, so like from, from financial perspective they also need to basically justify the return on investment like the payback period also so right. maybe uh, standing today we can uh, estimate a higher demand for like the this uh, person particular equipment and like disinfectants but down the lane maybe in few months or maybe six months one year so so it, it's it's quite tricky so i think they uh, all the uh, all the companies they should uh, consciously make a decision uh, to invest uh, in the in the right uh, portfolio nowadays all right thank you thank you very much Shazib khan uh, moving to Ms. Yasera, uh, businesses around the world have experienced adverse demand shock. Uh, there's, uh, I mean, we've we've seen over the years there's been this growth fanaticism in terms of uh, a, a tremendous variety of products in in a huge number. Uh, so let's let's talk about uh, the sustainable production and consumption aspect. Uh, I mean, the way pandemic has affected uh, consumer behavior and how, how do you see the elements of sustainable uh, consumption and production moving forward, uh, uh, you know, as a core part of uh, strategic uh, innovation that the organizations need? 
um all of us know ali that uh, after the pandemic uh, you know the, the household finances have decreased people are short of income uh, they're, they're short on savings and obviously they're short on spending uh, so you know uh, these these elements have uh, actually uh, they've prompted people to rethink their prior priorities not only businesses but individuals as well so if i speak of consumerism and and focus on it in individuals uh we know a lot of people out there um and as rafiq sahab also said they they fear losing their jobs and uh, they don't have a lot of savings at hand you know for those who have lost their jobs already uh right. so consumerism which was uh, you know b- before the pandemic we saw you know everything was moving towards digitization and uh, and there was lots of competition and you know we would see one product after the other and the the, the new one was better than the previous one and uh you know they would be all over social media and uh, you know it, it was a madhouse um mm. once the pandemic came about uh people it i, I think it was um, a blessing in disguise for the excessive consumerism that uh, uh, you know the world was uh, was 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 actually uh, faced with mm. uh all of us wanted more you know social media it made us uh, it made us envy others anything that was out in the market uh you know even if it was launched in the us uh within minutes uh people in china would know of it um right. so you know for example if it was an apple watch or or a, or a new phone you know it would be all over uh yeah. the internet um i think after the pandemic people have stepped back and uh, uh they've they've uh, sort of realigned uh, their priorities in in spending so uh, you know this was one of the cases this one of the biggest reasons why you know uh, we saw a big uh, fall um, in the purchasing of luxury products right um obviously people weren't going out so they weren't buying these things um people tended to shift their focus more towards uh, health and wellness um sanitization and self care so uh, while we saw a drop in 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 things which were probably good to have we saw a rise in things which uh, people started to consider must have for example um, spending on good quality food uh, spending on hygiene spending on self care uh, spending on fitness uh, i think consumerism uh, covid-19 is actually you know a reawakening of the consumer mm. i'd say um even if you would go out in the supermarkets be it pakistan be it uh, be it the uk be it uh, be it here in malaysia uh you know you would see uh, the aisles which house uh, fruits and vegetables and and milk uh, you know people would be like hoarding around them and um uh, you know when there was um, the, the uh, rumors of lockdown were were around uh people they actually they they were almost ransacking supermarkets and they were hoarding on this stuff so um i think consumerism has taken a shift and it has taken a shift for the better people now actually know what they need to survive and uh, not things that they need to you know show off on social media so um i, I think uh this is this is my input on uh, on the fact that this pandemic has actually been a, been a blessing in disguise for uh, you know consumers which were uh, driven towards getting things and did not know what to do of them thank you very much i uh, hope this reawakening sustains itself in our social psyche moving forward uh, i also uh, really like to add a bit on the production side uh, since yeah. you um, had, uh, touched upon that uh, topic as well um i I'd, i'd speak on behalf of the beauty industry since i had been affiliated to that a while back um uh, so this is published information that um l'oreal a company which i was a part of previously it had uh, um, shifted its focus from uh, making beauty products to making um sanitizers and uh, this is published information uh, that nearly you know 14 million sanitizers were distributed among the healthcare uh, workers as right. as part of the solidarity drive and not only sanitizers but also uh, uh, self care products were distributed amongst nurses uh, in the uae so uh, i think companies have also uh, woken up to being more human and understanding that uh, um, there isn't always uh, a profit uh, edge to whatever you're making 
there has to be the human side to to your business as well and in times of crisis such as uh, this one uh, i think um, a lot of companies they they did they did really well in in hmm. showing us what responsible production actually should be like right there's a lot of emphasis also uh, i mean as far as uh, the likes of norm chomsky are concerned in terms of uh, soulful corporations uh, humane corporations uh, that's that's uh, hmm. the order of the day and especially uh, the likes of developing countries like pakistan and uh, some others uh, that's where we need to uh, you know uh, have have some concerted effort uh, mobilizing uh, corporations private sector uh, governmental resources uh, civil society to create that civic infrastructure that helps communities survive and thrive moving forward uh so th- so there have to be you know some concrete recommendations which i'll also uh request you for uh moving forward when i come back to you uh rafiq saab i'll move to you now uh h- how do you see i mean uh you know the the civil society uh, along with the private sector and then the governmental resources combining and how we could entwine social responsibility aspect in it especially in pakistan's context you see uh, the corporations will spend money only if they are making money see this hmm. is uh, common sense if i right. don't have any money how in the hell i'm going to spend or hmm. secondly if i have enough money hmm. that i need to survive myself right. and i'm not going to be going out and spending money in my neighborhood or in my city right hmm. now there are a lot of companies they are struggling to survive right okay uh, the the money to be spent on uh, social responsibilities and services actually is very limited right now people are as i said scared earlier also and they don't know what tomorrow is going to bring uh, and i'm saying this from the uh, ngo perspective is also because i'm involved with a uh, few ngos directly and uh-huh. the kind of donations we used to get we're not getting it anymore it's not uh-huh. with just the uh, ngos that i'm with it's, it's across the board I've talked right. to a lot of people. Uh, they're very well-known NGOs in in Karachi and they are Pakistan-wide as well, and mm-hmm. they're all talking about uh, donations drying up. You know, NGOs yeah. don't have any source of income. They depend on the donations uh, from individuals and corporations. So it is going to be a challenge. The only way we can uh, spend money on these things and we can work on these projects is when there is money coming in. and that right. is like you will have to open the businesses okay uh, we will have to take precautions obviously human life is more important uh, than just making money uh, yeah. but the thing is that shutting down for a prolonged period of time okay. is detrimental it is going to hurt the economy now i have i've seen a lot of especially shop owners they were givers at one time now they are on the receiving end because the shops are closed there's no income they have to pay rent they have to pay utility bills because these guys are not going to let you go and there's nothing coming from government okay yes. to support them i mean uh, when we talk about even let's say for example uh, the money that the, the businesses contribute in sesi or pesi or eobis and all those places there's no help coming from anywhere okay their businesses are left on their own you know i don't want to be the ambassador of doom but this is the reality on the ground in pakistan okay uh-huh. is there is no help people are left on their own to survive but then there are conditions that you cannot determine anybody you cannot do this you cannot do that you cannot do that but you yeah. have to pay up the bills so how in the world are these businesses going to survive people are going bankrupt if they are going bankrupt they're not going to spend money in csr let's be frank and let's be very real on on this uh, although yes this is the only way because the government cannot do everything on their own okay because there's too many challenges in a country like yeah. pakistan with the population that we have so the thing is that if i don't have money coming in hell don't expect me to spend money where am i going to spend the money from how sure makes a lot of sense thank you uh uh dr don i'll uh, move to you now uh what do you think are some of the policy prescriptions uh i mean in terms of africa also generally in trying to uh, help these uh, smes uh, you know grow and then uh, adapt uh, to to some of the innovations in terms of digitization that you that you mentioned how can this 
uh, technology transfer be possible at, at the local uh, SME owners level? It's very, 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 very uh, important question. So, this, so you mentioned about innovation and everyone knows innovation and creativity is always based on research. It has to be a research backdrop for innovation. You need to find out what were you doing before that wasn't working? What are the new market environments and factors or drivers? And how can you appropriate or realign your services to the new market? So most of the time, or generally, innovation and creativity is based on research. Now, the issue is the fact that SMEs don't have money to have massive, interesting R&D departments like multinational companies do. They struggle. They already struggle with normal bills, like a uh, prof was saying. They are thinking about rent, thinking about, I mean, how, I mean, how to pay for, 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 uh, for electricity, to be able to cope with their business. So from a policy dimension, what has happened in Africa, and I think it's the same case in different locations, is the fact that there's a massive gap between research, academia in this case, and industry, SMEs. Okay, when you ask the average academic and say, well, um, so or, or say the average university, so we, do you have any partnerships with any companies? For some reason, and I've done this several as I travel around, they always come and say, well, uh, or oh, they, they always post the big companies, the, the massive companies, but that's not actually true. In developing economies, SMEs drive the economy, that's true. And interestingly, around the average university, and I've checked this, okay, there is normally a conglomeration of SMEs within and around the university. I did a small research and discovered there are over 100 to 1,000 SMEs, depending on how big the university location is or the city, within and around the university, within a one kilometer radius. But this is what I discovered. Most universities don't have any conversations with SMEs, which is strange. Right. So for a policy level, if the policy level dimension could be to arrange mm. to bridge the gap between universities, academia, and industry such that university supports the driving of the R&D framework for innovation for the SMEs using their students. I'll give an example. Mm. In Lancaster, for example, in the UK, uh, well, my, 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 in the Department of Environment, there are 24 environmental SMEs resident in the Department of Environment. It's called co-location. And the yeah. premise is that there is no way uh, the CEO of an SME and the professor would enter the same lift every day, that at some point they won't turn to each other and ask, but dude, what do you even do? And so it mm. means that by co-locating them, you force a conversation. Are you following me? Now, but interestingly, imagine where every year, and this is true, the university will do an email to all the SMEs around and say, do you have a small problem, a small challenge uh, as an SME, something you are thinking about doing for your research or to, to innovate on? Whatever it is, write it into a small proposal. It could be a one-month proposal, a two-month proposal. And all the SMEs will collate all this together and give to university. What do university do? They actually advertise these small, small projects to the students who bid for it for their master's thesis or bachelor's degree dissertation. So you find a student doing a small research project that an SME down the road is waiting for the results. These are simple policy leverages of supporting that, that bridging of the gap between academia, universities, and SMEs to power their R&D to give them opportunities for innovation. So you reduce the pressure load on them. It's an example. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Odon. Uh, moving to Ms. Yacera, uh, what are some of, the, some of the structural changes at the organizational level uh, at these uh, smaller SMEs, at the larger level in general that you feel uh, businesses need uh, moving forward? Uh, your mic is mute. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. So um, I think be it uh, an SME or be it uh, a large sized organization, um, post pandemic, uh, there are a few things that, uh, uh, you know, all of these businesses have to uh, have to incorporate um, in their very fabric, uh, to be honest. Right. Um, I think, uh, first of all, there needs to be um, a faster pace of decision making. Uh, right. Initially, you know, uh, businesses and even SMEs, companies which were headed by families or headed by, let's say, you know, a father and a son or two brothers, uh, there would be a lot of bureaucracy um, in, in, such, uh, in such companies and, you know, decisions, they, they'd often linger on um, right. in, in bigger companies because of the size and smaller companies because of the bureaucracy factor. 
so i think this uh, uh, this situation would help the businesses to involve uh, to uh, to evolve um and get a faster pace uh, of making decisions because now they know they have very little time uh, right. to to you know uh, uh, to to think out a lot uh, secondly i think um, there there's one point which i'd like to stress on for for all businesses is that they need to build in it efficiencies because uh, now since businesses are uh, you know we are mostly restricted to our homes and almost all businesses have a work from home um, approach uh, for the employees uh there needs to be um, uh, this 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 uh, very tight infrastructure um right. IT infrastructure you know which enables people not only to work but also to to communicate to to interact uh, to decide right. to meet up to to uh, you know apprise each other of what's going on uh, right. so i think every company needs to invest in it because uh, this uh, really would go a very long way for them even if pandemic uh, you know if if they're um, over with covid-19 and if they are beyond uh, they just cannot live without it efficiency anymore uh, right. be it you know building remote collaboration tools like uh, you know we we hadn't heard of zoom before <laughs> the covid-19 started off i mean honestly i started using it after uh, the corona virus outbreak and i think it's one of the nicest things to to, to be around um, and we i think companies need to be whether it's an sme or 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 a larger business they need to have this you know razor sharp focus on what needs to be done um, i I'd, i'd link it with decision making you know now you cannot linger on uh, as to what you have to do you know you have to see the problem you have to decide and you have to work on the solution and you have to have very tightly integrated teams and it systems for that uh, i think right. only then a company can survive all right thank you uh, whilst we we're, we're... putting a lot of emphasis on the ideas of uh, digitization and technological efficiency uh would also have to parallelly uh consider some possibilities for cybersecurity uh you know for for smaller as well as larger organizations moving forward and there can, can be a lot of uh, collaborative initiatives uh, going forward on that note now this is going to be my last round of uh, questions where i basically uh but also uh announcing that uh, we're going to be taking some questions we have a lot of uh, live feeds coming in uh, so we're going to take uh, different questions uh, uh, as soon as we're done with this round of questions uh, requesting everyone who's watching online to post your questions uh, on on uh, uh, for us uh, for for the panelists with the name uh, so that we could direct those questions uh, at them uh, rafiq saab moving forward uh what's what's the way forward um you know amid this pandemic and then you know post pandemic if we're uh being futuristic not just in in terms of uh, uh you can also talk about policy level uh prescriptions you can also talk about procedural recommendations structural recommendations at the organizational level so what are uh, some of your recommendations moving forward sir? see we will have to become lot smarter uh, uh, yusra is that the right uh, name Yusera. 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 Okay, sorry. Yusera uh, just touched upon that as well. Uh, we'll have to become lot smarter. We have to become a lot more efficient in terms of uh, our human resources. Uh, right. There will have to be multitasking. Uh, the efficiency has to improve tremendously because we can't carry uh, this kind of uh, the cost anymore going forward basis. IT, Yusera. has uh, in length spoke about spoken about that is going to be very very important and most okay. important as dr odon said that you have to be innovative you have okay. to think out of the box you know the conservative way of doing business the traditional way of doing business worked and it it's not, it's not going to be outdated okay uh, but the thing is that this is the time where you need to become more innovative you need to think of new ideas and especially uh, till this mess is over until the vaccines are easily available and everyone is kind of vaccinated and immune to this mess god knows if there is another strain is going to come of this covid or what else but the thing is that till then uh, we'll have to think how can we reach our customers how can we uh, go to them now they can't come to us to an extent uh, so we'll have to think of ways and we have to invest in um, uh, our it at the same time we'll have to invest in our people uh we'll have to make them smarter we have to make them more efficient and uh, 
decision making has always been very important. You said I touched upon it, uh, uh, and I think Dr. Olan also uh, has because when you innovate something, you are you are you're making a decision to change. A change is the key because if you don't if you don't have the flexibility to change, then you're going to be outdated. And outdated means you're going to be out of the game, uh, regardless whether COVID or no COVID. Okay, you have to keep innovating yourself and your company. So I think these are the things that we, the business leaders, will have to uh, look at. We'll have to become smarter. And time is the essence. You know, we can't wait for another six months to take a decision. Now the decision has to be taken now and today. And uh, the implementation has to start. And we need to actually. This is what the role of the leader is. To actually, what I, I usually explain to people, the difference between a leader and a manager is that the manager manages and he, he actually maintains the status quo. The leader is the one who can see in the future. Now he has got a crystal ball that he sees what is coming. So as a leader, we need to see the challenges coming, not right now, but in the next two, three, six months, a year, even five years. And we need to prepare our organization for those challenges so we can survive and we can take our organization to the next level. We can sit, we can mourn about the problems, we can talk about the challenges, we can we can just, you know, like sit and cry and create hue, but the thing is that it's not gonna solve the problem. The problem solving will come with decision, will bold decision, okay? We'll have to become bold and we'll have to become innovative and we'll have to become smarter than what we used to be. Otherwise, our survival is going to be very, very difficult. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, there was some disruption with the connection. Uh, are, are we done with the with the recommendations now? Yeah. Yes, uh, Dr. Rafiq, uh, Mr. Rafiq Sab just uh, gave his recommendation. Thank you for giving me the doctorate. You know, I just was the easiest doctorate anyone could <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we live around doctors, so it is spontaneous. <laughs> we call everyone doctor. <laughs> well, I don't mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to Dr. Udon, uh, not just in terms of your recommendations, but also would specifically want you to shed some light on uh, SMEs and, and the way forward generally in terms of policy or procedural recommendations. So I, th I think for me, the way I say is this. I saw uh, before COVID, I did, I did a nice research and I engaged over 1,000 SMEs across six countries. And right. it's, it's, it's very basic research. And, it's, and, and, and the research was this. When I asked them, how many of you SME owners are doing a, an SME on a product or a service that has a link to what you studied in university? I discovered actually that less than 5% of them showed the case. But when I ask yeah. them and say, how many of you are doing a business or owning a small SME around a passion of yours or a new interest you discovered or a new market? Over 80% of them show the case. But I discovered, as a matter of fact, that most SME owners who actually develop a new business based on an idea they have or an interest they love or a new market niche, most of the time don't find the time to actually research more and study more on that subject matter. So my point is this, see, no matter how, how good you are, the more you learn, the better you get. So what COVID has done has provided an opportunity for SME owners to learn some more, do some mm -hmm. more research, find out about stuff. There is so much free programs, free training available that it has never been. And so for me, it would be sad for an SME who is trying to increase his capacity or his portfolio to go through COVID and not spend some time finding out who is offering a free scholarship, who is offering a free master's, because they are now. They didn't used to be, but there is so much available skills development opportunity for businesses, for the individual, to increase your capacity in the COVID era so you are ready and good to go after COVID. It boils down to the point around time management. Before right. COVID, you always said, oh, I wish I had more time. I'll have a business plan. I wish I had time. I'll start a new venture. I wish I had time. I'll think of why a new segment, uh, market segment. I wish I had time. I'll innovate my product. Now in COVID, you've had time. Have you done it? No, you've not. So, so what's the point? So the concept of time management has never been so important.
for the average employee or SME owner as it is now. When you understand that time is a resource, when you hear time is money, I literally mean for the individual to look at time as money. How much time right. do you invest in things that are relevant to you? Have you written a book? Have you researched what, what are my new partners that I can increase my business on? How can I get? And interestingly, and this is very important, I want to wrap up with this. Most of the resources that you require to move from one level to the other, I don't mean financial resources. When I talk about resources, people's mind always goes to cash. There are a lot of resources available that has not no cash alignment. You can actually leverage on. You talk about partnerships. People have LinkedIn profile. Do you have a business LinkedIn page? Who knows you are existent? Who knows you have an offer? It's a simple, simple, practical thing. An SME owner can start doing a bit differently, no matter how small you are, to be available in this space. I always ask you for a simple, a simple question to show you your, your global position. I said, Google your company name. Google your name. If Google is having epilepsy to find you out, there is something wrong. Are you following me? If Google is coughing, and maybe at the end of the search tells you, did you mean this? That means there's something wrong. So my point is, it's a good time to increase your presence, your leverage, your profile, your offer in this space you now live, or else you'll be in trouble. My recommendation. All right, All right thank you. Uh, moving to Ms. Yasera for your recommendations, please. Um, I would, uh, uh, you know, elaborate on uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Odon just said. Um, you know, in times uh, such as these, it's extremely important to build a skill set for everybody. Um, we cannot just have our degrees in our hands and, you know, wait for the opportunity to come to us. Because right now we know there is no opportunity uh, hanging about. Uh, if there is an opportunity, it's something that we have to create on our own. Um, I would, you know, uh, cite my own experience, um, my own journey, uh, which I, um, uh, you know, experienced through uh, throughout this time, was that, you know, if, if, if you have a degree, if you've studied this and if, if you've studied that, um, and, you know, you're employed somewhere and you're happy with what you're doing, and one fine day, you know, you're not working anymore, or uh, you got laid off because uh, of, of COVID-19, What's next for you? Um, or, you know, putting th this whole perspective onto an SME. If, if you're an SME, you think you're doing fine, you're making the profits you wanted to make, and, you know, you're going on a, a specific pace and you're happy with the pace. And then one fine day, COVID-19 happens. So, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you, you're all shut down. So let's say you're a salon or, or, or you're some service provider. Right. What's, what's next for you? And I strongly felt that uh, you know, we, um, as, as individuals, we have a great lacking in developing a skill set of our own. We do not know what's next for us if a calamity befalls us. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, people who, who, who could write, who could paint, who could talk, who could give motivational lectures, uh, home bakers, you would notice them thriving uh, in this time, you know, uh, because everybody was homebound. So, you know, people, uh, all homebound people were connecting with each other because everybody was in the same situation. Uh, so I think I, I greatly uh, felt this lacking in myself. And I think a lot of other people would have felt the same thing that they uh, never focused on developing a skill set uh, for themselves. Um, something that would, uh, you know, help them to get out of the crisis uh, during such times. Uh, SMEs, they, they need to think, uh, they, need, they need to have a lot of innovation. Um, it doesn't always mean that you need to have the right capital. I think you need to have the right ideas. As Dr. Odon said, uh, you know, recession is when the ideas come. I think it's not necessity is the mother of invention. In times such as these, it's recession being the mother of invention. Because, uh, I mean, take, take this webinar as an example, you know, before uh, the pandemic, none of us actually thought that, you know, we'd be sitting uh, across three countries and, you know, talking uh, like this. But now, after the pandemic, this is a reality. And uh, I think moving forward also, uh, um, events such as these, they would take place. So I think we, we need to think out of the box. Thank you. Uh, that concludes uh, our show, in a way, on, on a very positive note that the pandemic holds a lot of promise. Uh, we just need to open our eyes to it. Uh, let's have some questions added to the screen. Uh, meantime, I move to Imadul Karim Saab for your recommendations, please. 
Okay, my recommendations in this regard are uh, strictly focusing on technology. Because mm -hmm. whatever we are thinking out of the box, whatever plans we are making, if this technology is not there, it is very mm -hmm. difficult to execute the plans. So in this right. technological error, it was the blessing and the disguise that we have the updated technology to execute our plans. And I want to congratulate the leadership of my organization, especially Madam Seema Mughal, the Vice Chancellor of Greenwich University. So due to her proactive approach, when this COVID situation occurred, initially when the government stopped uh, students coming to the university initially for two weeks, so we started planning from, from the very beginning. And I think we were the first university in the private sector uh, that responded to this pandemic situation. And mm -hmm. we were uh, uh, pro proactive in our stance. So mm -hmm. we made all the plans and uh, this uh, semester in, which was affected was smoothly conducted. Now we entered into the next semester, which is summer semester, and all the things are going very smoothly. So all the things were managed, all the plans, uh, uh, all the plans were successful just because of the technology. So technology right. is the key, I think, uh, for, for uh, as this thing, thing keeps on going further or maybe a lot difficult situation occurs in future, we should adopt the latest technology and make use out of it to execute our plans and whatever uh, we are thinking out of the box, it is possible only just because of the technology. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, have the first question. Uh, the first question is, what industries do you think uh, would be affected most globally due to this pandemic? Uh, Dr. Odon, would you be so interested? I, mean, in I, yeah. I, I, I think um, two, 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 the, the two biggest industries would be transport and hospitality mm -hmm. because they're the industries that have got the biggest need by design for people to yeah. come together. So if you're if I, if I avo avoiding people, then that, that industry cannot work. But it means that, but, but having said that though, every industry, agriculture, it doesn't matter, medicine, education, has got in, COVID would have impacts in one level or ramification or the other. So I guess the, I, I guess the question is finding out within the supply chain of that industry, at what mm. target point is there an opportunity for innovation? It doesn't have to be all of it. Hey, follow me. Right. Within the supply chain, at what specific points of the supply chain is there an opportunity for creative innovation that provides potentially a new niche offer within the sector? But generally, every industry will be affected, even though the highest will be transport and hospitality. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that valuable question, Dr. Musarat Adnan. Uh, she also happens to be the dean of uh, Greenwich University's business management faculty. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, mainly uh, hospitality sector uh, in particular has also had like the, the domino effect uh, along along with the travel uh, and other uh, concerned uh, fields. Uh, moving on, uh, the next question uh, is due to pandemic, many businesses shifted online, but many businesses cannot work online and human element is essential. So what should they do uh, to switch their business to something more practical uh, for online or uh, wait things to get normal? Uh, Ms. Yusera, would you like to take this question? Um, certainly. Uh, I think businesses which cannot go online right now, I think there'd be very few businesses which can actually say cannot go online. Uh, an online right. business can also mean that you have a Facebook page where you can interact with people and uh, okay. perhaps show your product or do a live session and uh, yeah. take their orders. Uh, so I think the possibilities are endless. Uh, even mm. if um, your business cannot go online. Um, whatever little interaction you have, you need to have your own uh, little SOP in place. Um, and you obviously need to innovate. So let's say because of the pandemic, uh, the demand of whatever you used to make or whatever you used to do has fallen. What's the next best thing that you can do? That is the question yeah. that you need to you know, sit back and ask yourself. As I said earlier, if I question myself, uh, you know, fine, the pandemic is here. Uh, I don't have a job. Uh, what is it that I can do? Can I paint? No. Can I cook? No. Can I, you know, 
so th- yeah. there's a lot of can i uh, in this you'd have to actually sit back and ask yourself what is it what skill do you have to to you know upskill yourself and yeah. uh, i think in any business you you actually have to put your since the, the question doesn't exactly tell me what the business is um i'd be a, a little general in addressing this uh, but uh, right now you know every business can go online there's no such thing as my business not being online even right. if you sell, sell eggs you can make a facebook page and you can um, start interacting with people you can go live uh you know here in malaysia i don't know about other countries but here in malaysia there was a very interesting thing that i saw that during the pandemic people uh, you know there was a lot of focus on on health and wellness you know people would uh, um, uh, they would like to exercise in their homes or in front of their tv screens and just to feel a little better you know they they'd like to wear some sports uh, attire or joggers perhaps and uh, uh, you know there would be uh, there would be sellers there would be individuals who would right. set up a live feed uh, showing uh, showing of you know second hand shoes hmm. so that people from all walks of life you know be it rich be it poor uh, if if you cannot afford a, a branded shoe you know there's a second hand shoe available for you and there's a live feed going on for that so if you're interested you can just you can just hit like i mean you know in this day and age who doesn't have uh, a touch screen uh, hmm. from from the uk to malaysia to pakistan look around yourself and uh, technology has become extremely cheap uh, mobile internet is with everybody it's with our tailor it's with our milkman it's with our it's with our taxi driver uh, yeah. entire entire you know uh, transport companies are, are being run on run on it and they, they they like calling themselves tech companies by the way um, yeah. so, you know the use of technology the use of social media space it's not restricted you just have to you just have to tap into it yeah besides i mean there's no definitive end line for covid-19 so adaptation has to be uh, the priority right now i mean even for uh, survival of businesses not just in pakistan but also around the world uh i'll move to the next question now uh this is going to be the last question that we'll take uh what would you recommend for small businesses survival in pakistan in uh in the in this pandemic uh rafiq sab uh i'd like to request you to take the question please the survival of small businesses in pakistan you see i mean uh, i think the dr odon and jasera has uh, touched based on what uh, things that uh, is applicable across the board okay uh improving your skill sets uh, thinking out of box going uh, yeah. and using technology dr imad also touched upon that uh, i think you know i mean people are very innovative uh, and they are survivors as well uh, they right. are using technology at the same time they are using a lot of other ways for example the barber shops are not allowed to open in certain areas but the barbers are coming home and charging you four times more and giving you the service <laughs> so i mean people are innovative i mean this is a out of box thinking you can't come to me I'll, i'll come to you because you can't cut hair online you know you have to have a, a you know presence of a, of a barber with you so there are businesses like it who are surviving i think they're making more money than uh, in the normal times because they're charging you arm and a leg for every small service i mean in electrician if you call them to come at home what they used yeah. to take like say 10 dollars now they are charging 20 and 30 dollars for the same work so i mean you know they are making it up uh, but the thing is that i mean uh, if you are in a legit business and some some businesses are still struggling to open or they are in a lockdown area i think you know there is opportunity in every business but you have to again think out of the box you have to see what areas uh, of opportunity you have i mean it all depends on business to business but i i refuse to to take this answer that no there's nothing i can do because there's no such thing as that you know every mm-hmm. business has an opportunity but i can't talk about everybody but in general uh, terms that yes uh, the thing is that you have to get to the customer till things get back to normal which might take some time but the thing is that uh, and then you have to keep thinking as uh, dr oran said you need to start thinking that your your time is your money and as much as you think about how you can take your business to the next level and uh, that's your investment because sitting and, and just groping around it is not going to get it thank you very much uh, thank you uh, bakhtiar nasser for that uh, valuable question too 
Uh, now that brings me to uh, the end of uh, this particular session. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the one conclusion, one key takeaway that I have is uh, that this particular pandemic holds a lot of promise. Uh, it has created a tremendous room for innovation. The only thing that we need to do is to strategize that innovation and uh, uh, see how uh, business sustainability could be ensured. Uh, through that, I uh, offer my gratitude to uh, the distinguished panelists, uh, Rafiq Saab, uh, Ms. Yosera, uh, Dr. Odon, and Imad Al Karim Saab, uh, who's the head of department of uh, business uh, management with us. Uh, thank you, yeah. everyone, for your presence. Thank you, and everyone. As a, uh, as a, as a chairperson of this uh, webinar sure. session, I want to thank all the participants as well and the viewers as well who spared their time and joined us. Uh, inshallah, we'll have these kind of sessions in future. And uh, if uh, there's a uh, requirement, I'll we'll call you as well. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.